Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Sister Wives with Mary Jane Kay. I love, love, love documentaries. And I know everyone is talking about the Tinder Swindler and I have lots of thoughts. Um, so I'm just going to sum it up really quickly and then move on to cover another documentary that I love. But basically, the guy is a dick-faced con artist who manipulated playing the perfect boyfriend and fiancé with the insecurated life who left women in excessive debt. He's at fault, but also the women wanted love so desperately, so much, and they felt it was perfect and exactly what they wanted from love. But love is never that perfect, and I think the women should have asked themselves why a guy who was ultra-rich wanted to marry a woman who had average income. The only time an ultra-rich man marries someone who is has significantly, significantly less than him is if it's a supermodel or an A-list celebrity. There has to be something that levels it out, like their attraction level, maybe they're out of his league attraction-wise or education-wise. But typically, I and people do marry down people with less income than them. I'm not saying that that has to be a factor. But if someone is like living a $50,000 a day luxury life, you really have to wonder if you're not a supermodel or a celebrity and in that upper elite, why are they wanting you? Why are they love bombing you? So typically, if they're going to marry someone on a lower level, uh, a financial level than them it's a supermodel or an a-list celebrity there's some reason why and i'd really question why the guy was so eager to say i love you to get engaged to marry to be so perfectly curated with the jet and all the stuff and the things and if he made up a story about people after him and needing to hide i'd know that the jig was up i mean that was odd and that should have raised a lot of stirrings and red flags in the gut people that rich have a security if they need it and they get a security detail if they need it. And they don't get in situations where, oops, they need untraceable wires and cash. And can their fiance step in and borrow hundreds of thousands of dollars over and over again and I'll get you back? Would someone that wealthy not have more security and a contingency plan in place? People with wealth don't get in situations where they need their female friends or fiance to borrow money to wire or to send cash. It's very fishy and very illogical. It makes no sense. And I know the women got to go on the jet and meet the baby mama, and they got the flowers and the fancy hotel and all the right words, but anyone can easily pull that off or even stage it. Many influencers, in fact, most of them, pay just to sit on the jet and take highly filtered photos or to pose in the Lamborghini they don't really own. It's an impression. It's a false reality. And your gut tells you something is off. But I think the women ignored every twinge of their gut because they wanted the perfect fairy tale so much. And society trains you or programs you from a young age not only to want love, but that it will cure all that ails you, make the birds sing and the sun shine brighter and the whole world right. And a forever kind of love isn't insecurated, it isn't easy, and it isn't perfect. It's hard work. It may be warm and fuzzy for a while, but if you plan on it lasting forever and to grow old with a person, it's not always going to feel perfect or seem perfect or look perfect from the outside. It feels If it feels too good to be true and you're hearing everything you want to hear and you're being love bombed day after day after day, ask yourself why. Because people who are very eager and enthusiastic to give an excess of love right away before they even get to know you deeply and who seem unmatched to your lifestyle more than likely aren't in it for the reasons you are but they know what is programmed in every woman's mind or every gullible man's mind and they use that to their advantage and women do it to gullible, gullible men too it's not just men who do it but if they ask for money and they seem to have a circumstance to tug on your emotions and heartstrings to get that money and they shower love over eagerly without even really knowing you deeply, you should listen to your gut and the voice in your head and your intuition that tells you, I know I really want this, but something is off. From time to time, I might cover documentaries since I love them so much. And I actually watched a documentary about polygamy in Indonesia, but there was so much violence and abuse and coercion described in detail that I really, I watched it in full and it was a good documentary, but I had to stop scripting it because it was very hard to watch. And the women are just so distraught and crying and they give really detailed accounts of the coercion and the force and the violence. And I may cover it later on, 
But if a documentary about polygamy in Indonesia interests you, it's called Bitter Honey and definitely trigger warning, but it can be found online and I believe you can find it on YouTube if you search for Bitter Honey. It's very interesting and it's actually very well done, but again, it's hard to watch at times. And I would say it's worse than Cody, 100%. And it's sometimes done by force and there is a lot, a lot of talk about domestic violence. So huge trigger warning, but very, very, very interesting to watch. It really didn't make a great case for polygamy being a healthy and beneficial, positive lifestyle. I'll put it that way. But today I want to cover another documentary about a con artist that can be found on Pluto and Tubi and I believe on Amazon Prime and many other streaming sites and it's called The Imposter. It's about a con artist named Frederic Bourdin who tricked a family into believing he was their 16 year old son who went missing three years earlier. I don't know how some people can sleep at night, but I think there are people who just have no conscience, no moral compass and no empathy. If they don't understand their own feelings, and they certainly don't understand others' feelings, to them life is probably a game where they manipulate however they like to get whatever it is they need to live, whatever they want, and there is nothing they won't do to get it because they don't feel how it affects anyone, and they don't have a sense of right or wrong. To them, they are just getting what they need. The documentary starts with a home video of Nick. In 1994, 13-year-old Nicholas Barkley disappeared from San Antonio, Texas. His sister Carrie says she has nightmares thinking of what happened to her brother. Three years and four months after his disappearance in Linares, Spain, a man and wife who are on vacation go to the police station and they say they found a kid of 14 or 15 years old with no ID and no documents and he seemed very scared. Nick's mom is told that someone in Spain has Nicholas and this is three years and four months after he went missing. Everyone was ecstatic but bewildered by the news, and they were shocked to know that their brother was found alive and in Spain of all places. Everyone was excited. They were impatient to reunite. On October 7, 1997, that was the day that the couple went to the police station with the kid they found who was supposed to be Nick. He's scared. They got him food. He won't eat it. So they ask police to help with the kid that they found and we see the kid who is really the con artist as a grown man and he says he always wanted to be someone different someone else someone acceptable he says what was most important was to be convincing and he learned it quickly when the cops arrived he wanted them to have the impression that he was a kid and not a grown adult so the con artist was 23 at the time frederick and he was pretending to be nick and he said he knew it was very important that he behave like a kid. He wore a big coat and clothes a kid would wear, and he wore a low hat that hit his eyes, and he wanted to provoke a sense of guilt in the cops, that he was scared, that he was a scared kid, and he wanted to give the cops nervous reflexes so they had the feeling that they can't touch him or approach him, that they needed to be very careful about approaching him so they can feel as though something was wrong with the kid, that he was traumatized. The con artist, Frederick, is detailing how he did this step by step as an adult. He says he didn't volunteer to the cops that he was sexually abused, but he made the cops ask him if he was sexually abused by provoking the question with the way he behaved. Because he behaved in a way that provoked that question in the cops' minds, then they were the ones to ask him, did this happen to you? And it gave him the power. They ask him his name and where he lives and who he lives with, and he didn't speak much. He would say one word here or there, but he gave nothing identifying. And he, Frederick says it's hard for them to read a kid who doesn't speak much, barely uttering one word. And if a cop can't ID a kid and tell where they came from, then they can't keep them at the station. And he knew that they would put him in a children's home, and that was what he wanted. Frederick says no one ever gave a damn about him, and to know that if he changes his identity, the reward would be that he would be put in a place where he had people who cared about him and then he could be reborn. He was never given a childhood and he says to give a kid a childhood, you need to love them. He felt like he belonged there at the, other, at the children's home with the other kids and at this time he was 23 years old. I want everyone to keep that in mind. And he was considered like one of the other kids at the home. No one knew the truth. Back in San Antonio, Texas, Nick's mom tells how she told Nick to be home by dinner. She gave Nick some money to play basketball, and he left. He called home wanting a ride, and he was a couple miles from home. His mom always worked the late shift, so she slept during the day, 
and his older brother Jason answered the phone and he didn't want to wake his mom so he told Nick to walk home since it was just a few miles and that was the last time they heard from Nick. They cried for a day and then they got mad and then they got scared and then they got empowered and they made flower flyers and they did all kinds of positive things that could help find Nick. Nick's mom thinks a stranger offered Nick a ride and that Nick got in. And no, I noticed that Nick is fair-skinned with blonde hair and blue eyes. And what's interesting is Frederick the con artist is more Mediterranean looking with a little bit of an olive complexion, dark hair, and very dark eyes. And they don't look similar at all. Even three years later with the growth from 13 to 15 or 16, it looks like a different person completely. They wanted to ID Frederick at the children's home and they told him if he doesn't say who he is then they will fingerprint him and take his photo to id him so they know his identity because he wasn't willing to reveal it frederick knew he had to avoid the fingerprints and the photos so he did the only thing left which was to go to prison or prove to them that he is someone and prove who he is so he said he was an american that he ran away from home and he was willing to contact his family for them but he wanted to do it himself. He didn't want his family getting a call from the police or from government officials in Spain. He wanted to make contact alone. He wanted to stay overnight in an office to be able to make the call because of the time difference between the US and Spain. He has to be left in the office alone and he told them tomorrow everyone would have all the answers they need. He said the office was such that no one could hear him and he could convince anyone of anything. No one would know who he was speaking to or who he was calling, what he was doing. So he called the American police. He called the New York police. He called all different police stations in the U.S. And he told detectives who answered that he was a Spanish policeman named Jonathan Durian who found a kid from the States, but they don't know where from specifically. He told the detectives that answered while he was playing a Spanish uh, police officer, that the kid had been missing for a few years and someone has been looking for him. And the police told him that there are thousands of missing kids. They can't go through everyone individually, but they gave him the number for missing and exploited children in Arlington, Virginia. And he repeated his story to a lady who answered there and he described himself as the missing kid. Every detail he gave was a detail he knew he could fit in um, physically. He wanted to be vague enough for the lady to have as many possibilities of missing kids as possible that could also fit with his physical features. The lady said there was a kid missing from San Antonio, Texas from June 13, 1994, Nicholas Barkley. He asked for the lady to fax his photo and pretend he pretended to confirm the kid's identity like a policeman would do. He told her, let's see if it's him. He looked at the photo and he knew he'd been missing three or four years, so that would guarantee a change in how Nick would look over the growth spurt and changing in those years. So if there is a change, then there would be doubt. And if there is doubt, then he knew he had a chance. He said he felt he had to try and do it. He told the lady that the kid he had was Nicholas Sparkley. And the PD called Nick's mom and told her they found Nick in Linares, Spain. And she told the sister and they were all excited and bewildered and wanting to get Nick home quickly. Frederick knew that they would contact him to see and verify if it was Nick. Nick's sister called the Children's Center and she got on the phone with Jonathan Duran. So it was Frederick, the con artist, who would later pretend to be Nick, pretending to be the police officer, Jonathan Duran, so that he could talk to the sister. And he said he worked for the shelter and he was the one who spoke to Nicholas and got the info on his identity. And the con artist said that he told her Nick was seated next to him, but he was scared and traumatized and he wasn't ready to talk to anyone yet. Nick's sister said that Jonathan, the fake police officer, sounded responsible and concerned, and he told her Nick said he was abused and hurt and abducted, and Nick's sister thought Jonathan Durant was a social worker and he was very reassuring. Frederick said the sister asked what Nick remembers, does he talk about his family, and he told her that Nick has forgotten everything, he doesn't remember much. He remembers his sister, but not very much other than that. The sister says she was told that he was held by a trafficking ring and he escaped from there and was found wandering the streets of Spain and she was heartbroken about that but she was very happy. She wanted to hear Nick's voice but the con artist said there was no way he was going to be able to speak to her pretending to be Nicholas because it would have been too big a risk so he just said a few words. She said she loved him and she wanted to take him back home so he said I love you very briefly and she started crying. Frederick says he washed her brain 
and he has this delight in his eyes and this smile that gives me the creeps as he said this, as if he's proud of himself. He really has a duper's delight smile across his face as he's recounting the story, like you feel very little remorse and it really gave me the most evil spine chilling vibes because he just gives the smile and he has this look in his eyes. Ugh. So far, he is recounting the story with this duper's delight smile and no remorse. It's like he's proud of himself. It's very creepy, very sad. Frederick says he didn't stop because he never considered stopping. He didn't ever look in the mirror and say, what the fuck are you doing? Stop it. He realized he crossed the line and he was not just pretending to have another identity. He now stole an identity of someone else. An FBI agent in San Antonio at headquarters got a call to call Carrie Gibson, who was Nick's sister, and she was astounded by Carrie's story. The agent told Carrie when the FBI and State Department help her by getting her brother home, he immediately has to be interviewed by them. So the Consul General at the U.S. Embassy in Madrid, Spain, said anything involving a minor has to be handled quickly, and they are put in the position as a child's guardians. So the FBI agent then explains when a child is missing for years, the child is either dead, unfortunately, or not found at all. So to find the child alive and well in another country is incredibly rare. That's why the Consul General wanted to make sure they did everything right about IDing Nick and getting him home to his family. The agent was concerned about getting Nick home because she really wanted to start her part of the deal, which was doing the investigation, interviewing Nick about what happened to him and his experience. So the embassy sent someone to the children's home. The Center for Missing and Exploited Children sent Frederick a flyer with Nick's photo in color this time. It wasn't just a black and white fax. And it was a photo of him at the time of his disappearance in color. And Nick noticed that uh, that and Frederick noticed that Nick was blonde and blue-eyed and he looked nothing like him in reality. He burned the flyer so no one would see the color photo and they told him that the embassy representative was coming to get him. He couldn't do anything. All he could do was think about how to pull off being Nicholas and resembling Nicholas and he didn't know what to do. He ran away from the children's home. When the embassy rep got there, he was told that Nick had disappeared from the home. So the U.S. Embassy rep and someone from the children's home went looking for him. He tried running away, but unfortunately they found him, and the embassy representative was asked by his boss about his interaction with Nicholas Barkley, and he reported that he spoke English, and he was very convinced that the kid who, w Frederick, the imposter who was playing the kid, was an, actually an American. The next morning, he woke up and everything was normal, and he saw the director of the children's shelter who told him that his sister was on the way, and he thought, fuck, what am I going to do? Nick's sister had never traveled abroad. This was her first time, and she knew that Nick's mom couldn't do it, that it would be too taxing and too emotionally difficult. So Frederick said he should have thought about the consequences, and he knows someone would come and meet him most likely, but he didn't think about the consequences of that. Nick's sister says she felt fear and anticipation. Frederick said, you can't prepare to play the role of a person you don't know that you've never met. He didn't know even if Nick was left or right-handed. Nick's mom says Nick thought that he was an adult. They called him 13 going on 30, and he was difficult to discipline. He was a very determined child. He had run away before for a night or two, um, but he would always show back up or his mom would find him. He was very street smart and he was very city. He wasn't just an innocent and sweet child. And he was blonde haired, blue eyed, and he had a gap between his teeth. And as we know, the con artist also has a gap between his teeth, but he had olive skin with dark eyes and dark hair. Frederick did everything he could to give himself a chance. So he bleached his hair to make it blonde. And the missing flyer said Nick had three small tattoos on his hand, so he found one of the kids who dabbled in tattoos with a makeshift needle, and she tattooed the con artist with the same tattoos that Nicholas had. Frederick put a hat on and sunglasses and a scarf, and he thought he would be beat and arrested and that it would be over soon. The children's home told his sister that he was locked in his room all day, he wouldn't let anyone in. And Frederick was sure that his sister would tell him that that was not her brother, Nick. He went down expecting to be found out. His sister felt relief seeing Frederick, and Frederick was shocked. She said, I would never forget that nose, and that that nose looked like 
their uncle Pat that the, the boy resembled their uncle Pat that she found in Spain and that Nick always had that nose. He didn't say much other than I love you. And he said he doesn't know how she thought it was Nick and how he pulled it off and how she believed it. But she came for Nick and she wanted Nick back. So she believed it was Nick because she wanted it so badly. Much like on Tinder Swindler, the women wanted love, so they believed it was love despite the obvious. And this is the same kind of thing. Most con artists take advantage of knowing someone is desperate for something, and if they are desperate, then they will ignore the red flags and gut feelings and really everything in front of them, and they will overlook it because with the misgivings also come the thing they want so bad. And rather than give up the thing they want so bad and are desperate for that isn't even reality, they would sooner ignore all the obvious signs and red flags because they want the thing so much to the point where reality matters less than the thing they are desperate for. And Nick's sister believing it was Nick is an example of that. This was very cruel, very, very cruel, very disturbing that someone would behave in this way and, and pose as a missing brother and son of someone and i'm sure no one believed a person would be posing as nick but it is very rare to find a missing kid years later in another country alive and well he believed it was nick and no one would assume anyone would lie i don't know how frederick the con man sleeps at night how could he hug her or say i love you and go through with it and sleep at night they sat in the visitor room together and looked at family photos and the sister brought albums of photos and pointed out who everyone was and the houses and this was when this happened that's so and so that's when x happened that's when y happened so basically without realizing it she was giving frederick all the info he needed to further deceive sister warned the mom that nick was quiet and he looked very different she says he spoke with a funny accent in a whisper like he was hiding something, but she just thought, look what he had been through. He was held, he was abducted, he was trafficked in another country, and that must have been what accounted for the differences in Nick. The judge in Linares, Spain, wanted to make sure there was a legal basis for Nicholas to be Carrie Gibson's brother. So the problem was the sister and the U.S. Embassy were vouching for Nicholas being legit. But the police and the prosecutor and the judge weren't convinced at all that this was 100% Nick Barkley. The judge wanted separate interviews and they used the photo album as evidence. The judge says the only way to prove Frederick is actually Nicholas is that there are pics in the album his sister brought that he assumed the judge assumed he had never seen before. And he will show Nick five of them and make sure that Nick can identify who everyone is and what was going on you know, around the time of these photographs. And Nick got all of the photos right, except for making a mistake on the fifth photo identifying someone. But the sister was convinced already that it was Nicholas. And the embassy official documented Nick as a U.S. citizen. He also believed that that was Nick. Frederick says he wouldn't have been able to do anything if Carrie hadn't shown him those photos in the visitor room before this uh, judge made him identify people in the album. They took his photo without the hat and glasses he wore. And he became a U.S. citizen. He got a passport as Nicholas Barkley. They show Nick's passport with the photo of Frederick. And the photo, to me, doesn't look like a 15 or 16-year-old. The con artist was 23 at the time the passport was made. And the passport photo looks like someone older with bleached hair. It looks nothing like a teenager and nothing like Nicholas, in my opinion. It's crazy to me that Frederick got away with this. That the sister believed it, even though she knew he was strange and had differences to Nicholas. The sister seemed to look for things that would coincide with what she wanted, like saying his nose was like Uncle Pat and Nick had that nose. Of course, no one would believe it would ever be a person posing as a missing kid. It seems completely ludicrous that that would be the case. So if you want to believe something and you aren't expecting to be conned and the sister felt this is Nicholas and the embassy believed that it, that and it went through, but he doesn't look like Nick and he looks like a grown man and not a teenager, I mean... Of course, no one would ever think someone would pretend to be a missing kid. It's all so far-fetched, and it gets even more far-fetched. Both that they accept him as Nick and that it would be a con artist posing as Nick. It's unbelievable. It's also unbelievable how cruel this con artist is. To put this family through the emotional suffering of losing Nick and then deceiving them by being the person they desperately wished was alive and well with them, to heal that initial suffering, only to suffer again, finding you lost Nick twice, 
and that nick is really gone to have the dream fulfilled and then taken away and left with that hole and with that suffering must leave indescribable pain and also a lack of trust and to prey on people's hearts and emotions with no remorse is such a heartless and callous way to be and it's so disturbing it feels akin to emotional terrorism some people have no conscience and that's the scariest thing at any point frederick could have said this is wrong how can i do this how can i hurt these people who have suffered more but he didn't feel that he felt wow i can't believe i made it so far i'll keep going he always wanted to be someone else and he was getting what he wanted and that came before everyone else consequences be damned the sister explains that they didn't talk a lot the night before the flight home when they shared a room. They were in a peaceful silence, and she felt very peaceful hearing him breathe, knowing he was with her and he was safe. Frederick was thinking of running away that night, so he knew that he could take the train, he could get out of Spain, and he went down a few times to run away during the night, but he also pondered if he was doing the right thing or the wrong thing. He says that when he was born, there wasn't much love. His mom was only 17, and she met his father, who was an older man from Algeria, and his grandfather was a racist who didn't like anyone but white people, apparently, or French people, I'm guessing. So when he knew his daughter was pregnant by an Algerian, he wanted to have an abortion. He said he was already prepared not to know who he was. So now he had a real identity and an American passport and he could go to the U.S. and go to school and live with a family and be someone without ever worrying again about being identified. Frederick saw the opportunity and he said a woman who would do something so loving as to bring her brother back home when she had kids, leaving her kids to go and get him and bring him home to a loving family, that that was someone good. And he had conflicting ideas in his head of wanting an identity and a family and a life and of questioning if he should just run away. At no point did he seem to consider being honest and telling the truth. It was run away to emotionally torture the family some more so they would assume Nick ran away from them and was hiding abroad rejecting them or going to the U.S. and having what he wanted. He didn't consider ever being honest or taking accountability. If he ran away, he wouldn't continue the con, but the family would probably still believe it was Nick and that Nicholas was traumatized and alone and rejecting them. So it might have been better than living with them and going along with the scam, but it wasn't the right thing to do either. The right thing would be honesty. Frederick knew that the sister wanted to believe he was Nicholas, but he didn't know if the other family members he met would want him to be Nicholas so desperately that they would buy that he actually was Nicholas. The sister didn't understand Frederick's nerves. He was fidgeting at the airport constantly, going to the bathroom, watching all the people at the airport, watching his sister constantly. And Frederick said the sister constantly looked at him. And she felt his nerves were attributed to his fear that he was going home and no one knew the details of what happened to him and how it affected his mental state. She thought maybe he was afraid he wouldn't be recognized or his mom would no longer love him. Frederick feared he would get killed because he knew that he was lying to these people, and he thought maybe he should abort the plan. But when it was time to board the flight, they boarded together. I noticed when he thought about aborting his plan, he said he feared being killed or the consequences of how it would affect him, should he be discovered to be a fake. He never said he was concerned how Nick's family would feel. It was about him fearing for himself, not how the scam affected the people he was scamming, who were being amazing to him. Nick's mom was nervous and happy and the whole family went together to the airport and everyone was excited. They didn't know what to expect. Frederick says he didn't want to get off the plane. He wanted to prepare himself. It was October 18, 1997, the day they landed, and they show home videos of Carrie and Frederick walking into the terminal. Frederick had no strategy. He knew there was no way out and he couldn't turn back. The mom didn't know how Nick would be the type of person he was now. Nick's mom wanted to hug him, but he pulled back, so she grabbed his hand and hugged him, and she told him she missed him. Nick's mom said he changed so much that it was mind-boggling, but she realized he had been through horrendous stuff, so that's why he was different. Carrie says her family was there and everyone was happy. The mom says Frederick was totally covered up and bundled up in his jacket and hat, so she got scared, thinking Nick must have been very messed up, just based on his appearance. Carrie's husband says he was quiet and standoffish, and Frederick explains he never liked people to touch him, and he knew he couldn't pretend to like it, so he was cold and closed off so everyone could feel from him that he didn't want to be held or touched, and he didn't say anything. He really didn't say much. He was happy that so far he got away with it, but he didn't show it. He said he has a border in front of him, and he didn't want to screw up, and he was very concerned someone would find him out. 
but everyone welcomed him with open arms regardless of how standoffish and cold he was being and they wanted to get him home. The mom observed him in the car the whole way and she felt his uneasiness so they put some music on to make him feel more comfortable and it was a quiet ride home but everyone was excited and all smiles thinking everything was over they finally had Nicholas back. Frederick felt he had a family and he never dreamed of having an actual family and a place where he was loved. And he woke up in the Texas country and he wasn't expecting it. He thought of the U.S. as a big city with buildings everywhere and people all around. And they took Nick shopping and he knew that he had to recognize some landmarks and some things as familiar for the family. And that he couldn't, because really he had never been there before and he didn't research the area. He didn't know what it was like. They met people who knew Nicholas before he disappeared and he had to tell people that he didn't remember them. And there may be an inkling there, but he just couldn't remember people and he couldn't identify them. And he told everyone that was because of the trauma. He lost his memory. That's totally absurd. If Nick at 13 was abducted and trafficked for three years, he would have tons of trauma and he might even disassociate from the memories of trauma. But would he have total memory loss to forget everyone in his world and everyone who knew him? That doesn't seem plausible or believable to forget the people he knew just three years ago completely to the point where he can't remember any faces or names at all. The mom thought he wasn't remembering because he was traumatized by what happened. He remembered seeing a photo of Nick making a peace sign with his hands, and so he made the peace sign a few times as a way to say hello because he knew that that was something Nick had done in a lot of his photos. And he thought to himself, that Nicholas Barkley could reappear anytime at the house, and that was his worst fear. The con man's primary concern wasn't hurting everyone, but it was the real Nicholas showing up and the consequences to him. Carrie, Nick's sister, felt it was best to give Nick a normal routine every day and a normal family atmosphere, and everyone took time to hang out with the con man they believed was Nick. Frederick would go on drives with Carrie's husband, or he would go to play with his sister's son, or his cousin and his friends, and he even found a girl he liked in the neighborhood, Amy. Let's remember, this is a 23-year-old guy posing as a teenager and hanging out with people he's supposed to be the same age as, and now he's found a girl that he likes that's a teenager when he is 23. The only family where Frederick still hadn't met and passed with as Nicholas was Carrie's half-brother, Jason. He came to see Frederick, and he didn't look at him as Nicholas or pretend to look at the con man as Nicholas. He told Frederick good luck and left, and he basically made it clear he knew that that wasn't Nicholas. And they ne never discussed with Nick what happened to him during the abduction and the trauma he, he had faced. They felt when the time was right, Nick would just open up. The FBI agent never received any calls saying Nicholas was back to come interview him, so she felt it was important to quickly interview Nick, so she agreed to meet him to conduct the first interview. She told him the purpose of the initial interview was to get his account of the kidnapping and for his help to locate his abductors. And the FBI agent only knew the info from the missing posters regarding Nicholas. She said it isn't that people can't change in three years, but to her, this person in front of her did not appear to be 16. He had a shadow of a dark be beard, and she doubted a 16-year-old Nicholas would already have a shadow of a beard, let alone a dark beard, considering Nicholas had blonde hair. Frederick was very nervous and he seemed very uncomfortable during the interview. He told the FBI agent he was taken by military overseas, he was put in a van and abducted, and flown over to an undisclosed location and he never knew where that was. He said that he was kept in a room with different kids and they would be drugged with chloroform and they would wake up in a place they didn't recognize where they were, and that all the kidnapped, kid, kidnapped kids were subject to sexual abuse by high-ranking military officials, and that each night all of the abducted were abused by men in the military who were American, Mexican, and European. And he said they broke his hands, especially his right hand with a baseball bat, that they tortured him, they, they burned him, they fed him insects, they broke his fingers, and they broke his left foot with a crowbar, and he said he was um, ard, I'm not going to say the word, and they kept the kids in line by using military scare tactics and they experimented on them by doing things like putting needles in his eyes and putting headphones on them, forcing them to listen to screaming and yelling. And he said Spanish words kept playing over and over through the headphones saying, you are not you, you are not you. 
If he spoke English, they would beat him and that the kids were moved around in military planes and never knew where they were and where they were going. And they would change the identities of the kids by changing their hair color and they would change their eye color and they were all put in uniforms and they would put uh, drops in his eyes to change his eye color from blue to brown. And he was also sold um, trafficked. One day they forgot to shut the door where he was and he left through it and he ran through a hallway and got to another door, but he managed to get outside and he ran for hours and he discovered he was in Spain. So at that point he called the police and he was pretending to be the couple of tourists who found him and requested um, that the cops come to help this kid. And Frederick said the FBI agent was professional and she was horrified by what he told her because he had gotten to her emotions and she said it was a horrendous interview and she was quite shaken by it. To me, the eye drops that change your eye color seemed completely suspect and that the men in the, uh, the high ranking military officials were Mexican, American and European. How likely could it be that high level military officials could get together from three separate countries and use military planes to do this with multiple victims? It doesn't seem plausible, but I'm not the FBI agent and it's possible she's heard things of this nature before involving high ranking military. But to me, just the eye drops and that it was perpetrated by three different countries. It seemed really odd. The agent says most normal people won't lie and make up a horrendous story to that degree and that there typically wouldn't be lying about the detail and the torture uh, and details about the murder of different children and that that didn't seem like a normal thing that someone would lie about that. And uh, Frederick did have a limp when walking and he also had a broken hand that hadn't healed correctly. It wasn't medically attended to. So... Um, those things kind of corroborated his story and they bought it and the agent kind of bought it as well. And he also did have cigarette burns down the back of his head and on his ankles. And the agent said that Frederick either had been a victim himself or he was an amazing actor and she couldn't tell which yet. The agent said she would locate the abductor and end all of Frederick's trauma. Frederick said this was the last border, like the last wall he, he felt that was still up and now it was down and he felt he won the game and the game was over and won. He had a U.S. passport as Nicholas Barkley and nobody was investigating him or suspicious of him in the family or with the FBI that he knew of. Frederick was happy and he couldn't believe his luck. Now we are introduced to private investigator Charlie Parker. He got a call in November from a TV producer for hard copy and that was an old, like, it was a news and entertainment show, I believe. And he told the P.I., uh, the producer from the hard copy that a boy had been missing for four years and he had turned up and he wanted the PI to track the boy down so they could get an interview. The PI found out where Nick's mom lived and they drove down to do the interview for hard copy. The FBI agent had repeatedly warned Nick to please not contact the media, to not speak to the media. She wanted Nick or fake Nick not to talk to the media because if any of the story even just one part of it were true and accurate, and there was a military high-ranking official involved, then the abductors would see that in the media and they would know there was an investigation and be able to plan ahead before the FBI was able to locate these people and interview them and do their job. Needless to say, the case made headlines everywhere. Frederick says he wanted the media's attention because he felt it would authenticate Nicholas even more. I'd argue that the least attention, the better if you don't want to be discovered as a swindler, but I'm not a con artist, so I really don't know. Frederick said he believed it would authenticate him and they would love him even more. This seems to be all about ego and extracting what he wants, regardless of the consequences or negative effects on others. Charlie, the PI, was there and he was watching the interview and he happened to see a picture of Nicholas Barkley pre-kidnapping on the wall and he looked at the real Nick's photo and the con man in front of him as he was doing the interview. And he said seeing the real Nick and the con man at the same time, he noticed that Nick had blue gray eyes and Frederick had brown eyes. And he said the hair stood up on the back of his neck and he knew something was wrong. So the PI asked for a photo of the real Nick's ears because he read about Scotland Yard using that method of comparing ears to identify and trace a man who killed MLK and they identified him at Heathrow by identifying his ears. I did not know and I found that very interesting. Not only that they found MLK's um, killer at Heathrow and they identified him by his ears, but that ears are so unique that they're like fingerprints and you can use them to identify a person.
Not many people were aware of that, but the PI knew the ears were a means of identity as unique as fingerprints. And he took the picture of Nick and he kept it. And he went to his office and he put the photos of Nick and the con man in Adobe Photoshop side by side, zoomed in, and he knew the ears were completely different and that the man claiming to be Nicholas was not in fact Nicholas Barkley. The PI thought Frederick must be a spy. He thought, why else would someone come to the U.S. and take the place of another person? What would the motive be? He called Nancy Fisher, the FBI agent, and told her that Nick was a fake and that the ears don't match. And she told him to be careful not to intrude on a federal investigation. And the PI said that people aren't used to hearing about ears as a way of identifying, so it's possible that the FBI agent didn't understand exactly what he was saying. And she said she thought she didn't have a right to question the family claiming this was really Nick. She thought, how could his family be wrong about it being one of their own? That no one could be wrong about something like that. The FBI agent says no one would take a stranger from another country who speaks with a French accent um, and believe it was Nick and that it, because they accepted him even with the French accent that it had to be Nicholas Barkley. To me, the French accent would be an indication that it definitely wasn't him, but the PI says it was outrageous that most people who know about the case say they would know their own kid. Frederick said it became his American dream when he got to ride a big yellow school bus to school at 23. It's really scary that this grown man was attending school, portraying himself as a teenager in class with teenagers, riding the bus with teenagers. He said it was like a movie. He couldn't believe it was reality. And he's all smiles explaining this. No remorse or self-awareness at all. None. Zero. He says he officially succeeded at being a kid again and to have a second chance to be able to go to school and succeed this time. The PI was worried about the fake Nick attending high school. I don't blame him. And he couldn't believe this guy was lying about his identity and that the family accepted him despite the obvious. He was scared every day that the guy would go do something crazy like blow something up at the airbase or do something else terrible. The FBI had a difficult time trying to figure out who kidnapped Nicholas, when and where, and under what circumstances. The agent had no info because he gave very general info and he couldn't give specific details like names or faces or times. They ended up taking fake Nicholas to Houston and the FBI told him it was because he had been through trauma and that he needed to see a forensic expert to help him deal with his trauma. The experts thought that he was conducting a forensic interview to help figure out and identify who Nick's abductors were. And he felt something was off right when Frederick spoke because of his accent. Frederick says he spoke with the expert for a long time and he was asked to repeat the whole story that he had already told everyone. The expert said he didn't have the same physiological change in his posture or pupil dilation or heart rate that you normally will see when a traumatized person has to recount the details of their traumatic event. He couldn't speak English without an accent and the forensic expert noted that you can't be raised for the first six or seven years of your life in an English-speaking home and later not be able to speak English without an accent. Your ability to speak English doesn't just magically go away because you've been abducted in a foreign country for three or four years. The expert could guarantee, because of that accent, that the kid was not raised in an English-speaking family. It couldn't be Nicholas. He didn't know who this person was, but he knew there was no way it was Nicholas Barkley. So the FBI agent says the investigation took a 90 degree, 90 degree turn at that point. So she called the sister Carrie and she told her that the expert has said there's no way that this is Nicholas, your brother, because he can't be American and he, that he could actually be someone very dangerous. Carrie said she was scared and the agent warned her, do not come to the airport. You're not going to see Nicholas again or fake Nicholas again. She told her she would handle it completely. Please don't show up at the airport. So they flew back to San Antonio and... Who was there? Carrie showed up at the airport and she acted excited to see Nicholas as if they never had that conversation with the FBI agent who told her not to show up and that he wasn't her brother. The agent was really scared and she didn't know what to do. She wasn't expecting Carrie to be there and she wasn't wondering why Carrie was still believing this and ignoring what she said. So she called the U.S. Attorney's Office and asked what she should do and they told the FBI agent to let the con men return home with Carrie temporarily. At this point, I'm thinking, what the fuck? 
The whole time I thought that, but upon hearing from the FBI agent that the forensic expert confirmed it 100% could not be Nicholas, even though that's obvious, even to the layman. And then the FBI asked the sister not to show up at the airport and that it was an imposter and that he could be dangerous. And still she showed up. I could not believe it. And you wonder why then? The French accent was odd from day one, obviously. The dark skin, the dark eyes, when Nicholas, the real Nicholas, was fair-haired, the mismatched ears, the nervous behavior, the fact that fake Nick is 23 and he looks 23 when he's actually supposed to be 16, blonde and blue-eyed. They're all huge red flags. And the fact that he says he has no memories and can't recognize people who knew him just four years ago, was all of that not enough? The FBI agent was baffled as to why Carrie was there welcoming the imposter into her home pretending everything was fine because she told her clearly this Nick that you believe is Nicholas is not your brother. It's an imposter. But Carrie, when asked about it, says that the FBI agent didn't directly say that. I'm pretty sure the FBI agent told her directly that it was not her brother and not to show up and she refused to believe it because she didn't want to believe that it could the possibility that it wasn't Nick she wanted to firmly believe that it was Nick so she was going to ride that train this is nuts even without the forensic expert and the FBI agent telling the family there were enough red flags to know this wasn't their Nicholas but they desperately wanted it to be Nick so they ignored the reality in front of them and they believed it and maybe there were other reasons too we're going to find out the PI couldn't let it go so he went into their neighborhood where Nicholas used to live, and he interviewed neighbors to find out more info on the real Nicholas Barkley and the Barkley family. And he was trying to find out reasons why Nick would leave or disappear. And a neighbor who knew the real Nicholas said the cops would come two or three times a month over arguments with the mom's boyfriend or with the eldest son, Jason. And everyone said that Nick was a troublemaker. He caused a lot of trouble. He'd come home late at night. And the PI says, all families have arguments, but it's very rare to call cops over an argument because it escalates so badly. So the PI felt that there was much more than meets the eye going on in that house. The FBI agent knew that DNA samples could once and for all prove that the con man was not, in fact, Nicholas Barkley. The mom, when the FBI agent went to the mom and said, we need your DNA samples, the mom told her Nick was her son and she didn't have to provide any DNA samples. And she literally laid down on the floor and told the FBI agent, you can't pick me up and you can't make me give DNA. The mom recounts her version that she didn't want to go with the FBI, but she didn't remember refusing the agent. And the agent was stunned by her apathetic and hostile reaction the mom says her main goal was not to think about anything, and the sister says they didn't need to prove who he was because they felt they knew who he was. The agent saw that the family now, instead of being victims to her, she saw them as a questionable family from that point rather than a victimized grieving family, and she said they would have no reason to accept a stranger into their lives unless they had something to hide, and she didn't know what that was. Frederick says that when Beverly, his mom, refused to give blood, he became suspicious himself. They knew he wasn't Nicholas, and he knew they didn't believe what he told them as Nick, but they were not showing that they didn't believe him, and Frederick thought that that was weird. Frederick the con man even says, who wouldn't see it? He remembered in Spain, Carrie did everything for him. When he didn't know something, she would tell him the information and tell him he'd remember, and she identified the people and events of his life when showing him the album, and she went over it again and again and again to get it stuck in his head. Rick says she wanted to believe it was him, but he also thinks she may have been aware from the start it may not have been her brother, but she decided he would be her brother whether he was or not. He says the whole family went on with pretending that he was Nicholas as much as he pretended to be Nicholas, knowing he wasn't Nick. The PI kept thinking about the real Nicholas Barkley. At the time he disappeared, he was living with his mom and his older brother, half-brother, I believe, Jason, who also lived there. Jason, the older brother, moving in with Nick and his mom changed the dynamic of the family. Kevin, Nick's childhood friend, recounts that Nick and his mom were very close, and then Jason moved in and things changed. She loved Nick, and he was the light of her life, and Jason moved in, and he was a bomb, he was an addict, and he only cared about himself, and it made things worse. And it that his, the mother was even pushed to do drugs herself and that the house at that point became very volatile. The PI discovered in police files that a couple of months after Nick's disappearance, Jason called the cops to say his brother had tried to break into the house. The PI says people normally do stuff like that to make people believe that the person is still alive. 
and the PI started believing something happened to Nick in the house. Frederick the conman says he didn't need to be Columbo to put the pieces together. He surmised that it's possible someone in the family killed Nicholas Barkley and that some family members did it, some family members knew of it, and then some of it just chose to willfully ignore it. He no longer was worried about his worst fear of Nicholas returning. The FBI agent says that the fake Nick and his mom refused to cooperate regarding the DNA, so they had to execute a search warrant to get the samples. Frederick said he could no longer pretend now. They picked Frederick up and he felt aggressive. He felt anxious. He felt like he couldn't go on with this. He wanted a way out of Texas and a way out of his mental anguish. The FBI agent says fake Nick was becoming agitated and angry and she felt he would run away. The PI started tailing him every day and writing down license plates of all the cars of the people who visited Nicholas's mom. And then at that point, Frederick razor bladed his face. Um, he took a razor blade to his face uh, because he was so uh, distraught, I guess. And the agent says everything was getting worse and worse and snowballing. And Nicholas says he did that to show he wanted to show them he was under a lot of pressure. So eventually, in 1998, an official in Madrid called the FBI agent and identified the fake Nick, and he faxed the records over. And around that time, the PI had secured a breakfast or lunch meeting with the con man, and the PI sat with him, and he said to fake Nick that his mom, he had made his mom angry. And the con man told the PI, she's not my mother, and you know it. So at this point, the FBI agent waited for the facts anxiously, and meanwhile, Frederick tells the PI, he admits that he's, his name is Frederick Bourdin, and he was wanted by Interpol. He's, I think, 25 at this point from France, and that he uses false identities and has a pattern of passing himself off as a minor in different countries throughout Europe. And he accesses shelters for minors, and he has different aliases in different countries. He was Frederick Beard in Spain. He was also Benjamin Dion... Dion and the list goes on and on to a double digit list of names and identities well over 20 are listed i mean there's maybe 30 or 40 honestly and he has issues with self-harm and it also says in the records that he may need psychiatric help and that he's an escape risk in march 98 he is deported and the story broke nick's mom said that she knew it would be heart-wrenching but she never thought that it was not nicholas the sister says she felt sadness that it wasn't Nick, so now the family was left at square one wondering, where's Nicholas? She also felt, how can she be so fucking stupid? Frederick contacted the SAPD, the San Antonio Police Department, and he told them that the family may have killed Nick. So they ended up opening a homicide investigation of the family members um, for participating in Nick's, Nicholas's disappearance. Frederick told authorities that while he was in jail that Nick's mom confessed to him that her and Jason, the older brother, killed Nicholas and hid the body. She said she was accused first and it really freaked her out and she said, yeah, she had been crazy but she was never violent with her kids. And the PI says he thinks that Nicholas is buried at the house that he disappeared from. And the owner of the home has agreed to let the PI dig. The FBI agent says that if Nick's mom knew that the fake Nick was not her Nicholas, then there had to be a motive for accepting him and going along with the ruse and having a stranger live in her house, and it had to be something very scary, uh, an, a scary ulterior motive. The mom says she agreed to do a lie detector test. She wanted to prove she had nothing to do with this. She passed the polygraph, and the FBI agent was perplexed at that, and she asked the mom to retake it, and she passed that polygraph. So they did it a third time and she flunked miserably. She failed every question, so much so that the machine almost flew off the table. She lied on every question. The polygrapher, after the third try, when she failed, told the mom that it appears that she knows where her son is and what happened to him. She became aggravated at that point and she ran out and she was screaming. The mom said she failed because she lied about a question about stealing something, and she asserts that she didn't lie regarding Nicholas during the polygraph, just the other questions. She lied on all the questions not having to do with Nick, but none of the questions that had to do with him. The PI goes to dig up where Nick lived at his disappearance, and the FBI agent felt the mom had info regarding Nicholas that she refused to divulge and that Jason, the older brother, had info as well. The mom says that if Jason did something to Nicholas, she was unaware of it, and it's not in Jason's makeup to do something like that. Carrie insists that her brother and mother didn't kill Nicholas. 
The homeowner allows the PI to dig, and he says his dog, when they first moved in, would always go to the back corner of the yard where the tree is. And one day he was mowing uh, around that area, and he saw pieces of a plastic-like tarp sticking out of the ground. So he tried to pull it up, but it kept ripping on him. So the homeowner had just ignored it and let it go until the night before when the PI called and asked him permission to dig the yard up, and he remembered. The FBI agent tried to get a hold of Jason to no avail initially, but then she caught him when he was in rehab and she asked Jason about Nicholas's disappearance, and he seemed like he didn't care, he was very apathetic, and he said he didn't care. He said when Nick returned home, he knew it wasn't his brother, but he didn't feel like he should warn his other family members that it wasn't Nicholas because they just wanted to believe it was him and he knew there was nothing he could do. And Jason was very hostile. He refused to help, and he a little bit later, he was found dead from an overdose after leaving rehab. Carrie says Jason became the perfect scapegoat because he passed away and he can no longer be questioned. He can't defend himself. The mom says it's a nightmare and it's all lies and no one believes you or they think you are involved and it's getting in trouble for something you didn't do, but she really didn't do it. The FBI agent says the mom and Jason know what happened to Nicholas Barkley. She believes they know. Carrie wants to see one piece of evidence that would lock any of them up over this. She wants a shred of proof. She says the most hilarious one is that they would be willing to pick up a stranger and bring him into their home to hide the fact that someone in the family killed Nicholas when for four years after his disappearance, they were the only ones looking for him. Behind bars, Frederick has been calling the families of missing kids claiming to have information on them. When asked why he did that and told well, you didn't have that info, did you? He admits, no, he didn't have the info, but he's calling just because he likes to lie. Carrie says he's a habitual liar and nothing he says is true, that he did enough already to them, and then for him to, from jail, accuse them of harming Nicholas was beyond anything, and she basically, she says, fuck him, fuck Nick, or fuck Frederick. They closed the investigation into the disappearance of Nicholas Barkley because there was little evidence, and Frederick was convicted of perjury and fraudulently obtaining a passport, and he only got six years in prison, and he says he didn't give a damn what other people thought of him and what other people felt, and he cares only about himself and just about himself and fuck the rest. He was deported to France in October 2003, and three months later, he attempted to steal the identity of missing 14-year-old Leo Bali. He lives in France now, and he has a wife and three kids, and Nicholas Barkley is still listed as missing. I do believe that the family wanted to believe it was Nicholas and dismissed every obvious sign that he was an imposter, but I also think it's possible Jason may have been involved. I'm not sure, obviously, because you can't explain why the mom would refuse to give DNA and why, after the FBI agent told the sister it definitely was not Nicholas, and not to go to the airport, she still met him and behaved as though it was Nick. I think Jason met fake Nick once, and he seemed to know this isn't Nick, and he seemed sure. And we'll never know, was it just because it didn't look like and feel like Nicholas, or if Jason knew Nicholas was permanently gone? I think anything is possible, and this is just my opinion, but it's possible Jason alone did something no one wants to admit, or the mom was involved as well, or the mom was not involved but knew what Jason did, and they all know, or maybe just Jason knows, and the mom knows. And it's also possible Frederick was lying completely about the mom confessing. But it's very odd that this was a group of multiple family members who insisted against the obvious that this was their Nicholas. And at first it feels like willing blindness that they desperately wanted to be Nicholas, so they ignored the obvious. But there were so many red flags and differences that it feels obvious it's not Nicholas. And once we get to the point where the FBI agent tells the sister and she still shows up and continues the charade, and her explanation was that the FBI agent didn't tell her those words and wasn't clear in telling her that it's not Nicholas and not to go to the airport it leads me to believe that clearly there's some kind of odd motive. No matter how bad I wanted my family member, I'd know in my soul if it was them from looking in their eyes, from speaking to them, if it was them or wasn't them. And I can understand wanting it and allowing yourself to believe it for a short while, but to believe even after the FBI tells you that it's not them would mean they need to, they need it to be Nick and it must be for some other reason. If it was me, I'd know my family member wasn't going to come back with a weird accent regardless of the trauma they went through, and that would be a huge problem for me. 
Trauma doesn't develop French accents in a native English speaker, and trauma doesn't change eye color. I doubt, I really sincerely doubt eye drops change eye color, and even if they do exist, that they use them on the perpetrator, that they would have used them on the perpetrator. It just doesn't, it seems outlandish. And I'd know my family member had X color eyes, and if they came back with Y color eyes, I know there's no way. Eyes don't just change color. There are so many twists that this is just completely unbelievable. Wow. What do you guys think happened? Comment down below. Anything's possible. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you tomorrow with the Sister Wives finale and the 90 Days new episode on 90 Day with Mary Jane Kay. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good one. Bye.